Reminds me of waking up in the morning. Hi, I'm Joe, and welcome to another update of my household robot build. This is what it's looking like right now. It's been about a month since I posted. Um, this has been a pretty challenging project. I built the arm for it, or the neck, depending on how you look at it. The neck arm. We'll call it the neck arm. This is to accomplish my target form factor of a gandroid, kind of a goose-like robot. I feel like that's probably the right direction to go with this. The idea being that it has a low-slung, stable chassis and an arm, and put the head on the top of the arm because, well, you need to reach up and manipulate things, but also see over counters and things like that. This quest started something like six weeks ago when I got a motor for an RV step, the ones that will come out automatically when you open the door. It's a worm drive motor with roughly a quarter of a horsepower. Now, this was necessary because the shoulder on this robot needs to be very strong. Any weight on the end of the arm has a significant amount of leverage, so the motor's got to be kind of beefy. When I received this motor, of course, being me, I had to take it apart and look at the internals. It's a worm drive motor with some sort of rotary shock absorber in it, which probably is a good thing. It keeps impacts from actually just stripping out the gears. But it's fairly robust, and it was cheap. It was $19 on Amazon. Try to get a quality servo of this kind of power for that price. After putting the motor back together, it was time to start experimenting with the servo loop. For position feedback, I'm using a magnetometer, a magnetometer. I've been saying that wrong the whole time. I apologize for anyone. Uh, magnetic potentiometer is what the data sheet calls it. The chip number is... and... Getting older. <clears throat> right, it's the AS5600 magnetic potentiometer. And basically you put a magnet on the end of your rotating shaft and you put this chip up next to it and it measures the magnetic field to tell you the absolute position with 12-bit resolution. And it's a pretty good chip. I really like it. To go with it I needed a fairly beefy motor controller. And on Amazon I found this controller, the IBT2. Looks like it's probably all blurry. Anyway, I like this controller very much. It's simply an H-bridge. There's no PWM generation in it, which means that I'm feeding it raw PWM from my microcontroller. This is good news for a servo loop because you want to minimize delay as much as possible. Armed with these components and using one of my favorite Arduinos, the Seed Studio Shao ESP32C3, I began making the servo loop and I started doing it the complex way trying to make velocity calculations from the magnetic potentiometer. And that didn't go very well because, well, 12 bits of resolution on the end of a worm drive is not very good for trying to measure the shaft velocity on the motor. This was also exacerbated by a position sensing failure that I couldn't quite find. And it turned out that the flatted sides on the shaft of this motor were actually deforming the magnetic field. And so the position sensor wasn't tracking position very well and in fact if I tilted it ever so slightly it would even reverse its direction. So to move forward from there I needed to decouple the magnetic field from that shaft. I needed a 4 to 1 reduction for this arm anyway and so I involved my brother in his 3D printer and he made up a gearbox that I could put the magnet on and continue with my experiments. It turned out with this setup it was actually better to just simply synthesize an analog servo loop in code and drive the motor that way. One of the advantages I have here is this very little rotating mass in this assembly. Uh, typical hobby servos have long gear trains with lots of gears. With the worm drive you don't have a lot of that and also these motors are large in diameter and they don't spin very fast. So the motor actually responds very quickly when told to start or stop. And with a little bit of tuning, I got this setup working really well. I made a program that would take the servo and turn it to random positions. And then I also made it so it would turn at different speeds, so it would take the same amount of time to travel to each position, just to test how smoothly it can run in any direction. It also was actually pretty good at coping with the backlash in the gear train. This is not a servo gear train, so it's sort of sloppy. With that out of the way, it was time to start ordering some parts. Another motor, a cog belt, which you'll see where I used that, and some bearings, stuff like that. Those items got lost in shipping, so I had to order them again, thus part of the delay in another video. 
The first thing I had to do was figure out a mounting for this system and interface it to the chassis. Also I needed to figure out where each motor went. I decided I wanted both motors to be mounted to the chassis. I have a half inch metal rod that I'm using as the shoulder joint and the shoulder rotates freely around it. But also around that shaft I have another idler gear with a cog belt drive pulley and a belt that runs up the arm to the upper section. This gets all of the weight of the motors off of the arm itself, making the arm much lighter and increasing its overall capacity. It also is an interesting trick to decouple the torque of the arm. When the arm is fully extended at about a length of two feet, say if you had one pound on the end of that arm, that one pound would translate into two foot pounds of torque on the shoulder. But with this belt drive system, it decouples the torque on the elbow from the torque on the shoulder. So now if you have one pound on the end of the arm, that is one foot pound of load on the shoulder and one foot pound of load on the elbow. With this decided on, it took me forever to design the shoulder joint. The mountings, where the motors go, how everything interacts, and then finally start 3D printing them. And in that process, I again learned the limits of 3D printing. I had several broken pieces that just simply weren't strong enough along the print lines. I've also come to suspect that the silk silver PLA filament doesn't bond as well between layers. That's the only material that I've really had splitting problems with, and I had quite a few of them with this. It was very frustrating. The gears and pulleys and moving parts, incidentally, are printed in PETG, P-E-T-G, filament, which seems to be much stronger and takes the load very well. I was surprised at the robustness of the gears themselves. Now, with the upper arm, or lower arm, depending on how you look at it, the part that goes from the shoulder to the elbow finished, I started to experiment with it and find out how the servo loop performed. It was kind of shaky. Uh, I needed to tune the servo parameters a bit more, but once I had, the results were becoming quite acceptable. The elbow on this arm was made much more simple than the shoulder, since you didn't have all these concentric rotating parts all intertwined in it, and rotated very nicely. I also didn't have the splitting trouble, because by that point I had learned to make all the parts a lot thicker and more beefy whenever I had to press a bearing into them. And I started doing some tests with a stick put onto the end of the arm to act as the forearm of the robot. I was very pleased to discover that this arm has absolutely no trouble manipulating two pounds at the end of it. That's about a kilogram. The whole assembly seems fairly strong and robust, as well as precise enough for what it needs to do. All of my testing thus far has been with that same program that would randomly choose a position for a servo and move it there. The only axes on this arm that I have currently set up as a servo is the shoulder. The elbow, I'm just touching wires to the battery and making it go one direction or another. That comes next. Because of the parallel action that the belt drive gives to the elbow of this arm, it'll be really interesting to see how my servo loop performs, since that joint position will have to be constantly changed as this arm moves around as well. The idea now is to have the head at the end of the arm. Now, I'm still using a piece of wood as the forearm because I don't have the design yet for the end effector. It's going to have the head mounted on it, which the head will have some movement independent of the arm, but also a gripper of some sort, some way to manipulate the items it's supposed to handle. I want to be able to clear dishes from the table or pick up things off the floor. So the gripper design itself is going to be an interesting journey. And so now the final form of this robot is starting to be revealed. And looks pretty good so far. I'm happy with what I got. So like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. I'm Joe, signing off.